Great Haitians by Charles Dickens Audiobook 20x30 I took advantage of the moment I had sought one from the first to leave the room, after beseeching Estella's attention to her, with a movement of my hand. When I left, Estella was yet standing by the great chimney piece, just as she had stood throughout. Miss Havisham's grey hair was all adrift upon the ground, among the other bridal wrecks, and was a miserable sight to see. It was with a depressed heart that I walked in the starlight for an hour and more, about the courtyard, and about the brewery, Charles Dickens' Elec Book Classics Great Expectations Great Expectations I lay in that separate building across the courtyard. It was the first time I had ever lain down to rest in Satis House, and sleep refused to come near me. A thousand Miss Havishams haunted me. She was on this side of my pillow, on that, at the head of the bed, at the foot, behind the half-opened door of the dressing room, in the dressing room, in the room overhead, in the room beneath everywhere. At last, when the night was slow to creep on towards two o'clock, I felt that I absolutely could no longer bear the place as a place to lie down in, and that I must get up. I therefore got up and put on my clothes, and went out across the yard into the long stone passage, designing to gain the outer courtyard and walk there for the relief of my mind. But, I was no sooner in the passage than I extinguished my candle, for, I saw Miss Havisham going along it in a ghostly manner, making a low cry. I followed her at a distance, and saw her go up the staircase. She carried a bare candle in her hand, which she had probably taken from one of the sconces in her own room, and was a most unearthly object by its light. Standing at the bottom of the staircase, I felt the mildewed air of the feast chamber, without seeing her open the door, and I heard her walking there, and so across into her own room, and so across again into that. Never Charles Dickens' Elec Book Classics Great Expectations Great Expectations Before we left next day, there was no revival of the difference between her and Estella, nor was it ever revived on any similar occasion, and there were four similar occasions, to the best of my remembrance. Nor, did Miss Havisham's manner towards Estella in any was change except that I believed it to have something like fear infused among its former characteristics. It is impossible to turn this leaf of my life, without putting Bentley Drummle's name upon it, or I would, very gladly. On a certain occasion when the Finches were assembled in force, and when good feeling was being promoted in the usual manner by nobody's agreeing with anybody else, the presiding Finch called the Grove to order, for as much as Mr. Drummle had not yet toasted a lady, which, according to the solemn constitution of the society, it was the brute's turn to do that day. I thought I saw him leer in an ugly way at me while the decanters were going round, but as there was no love lost between us, that might easily be. What was my indignant surprise when he called upon the company to pledge him to Estella? Estella who? said I. Never you mind retorted Drummle. Estella of where? said I. You are bound to say of where? Which he was, as a finch. Of Richmond, gentlemen, said Drummle, putting me out of Charles Dickens' Elec Book Classics Great Expectations Great Expectations Much he knew about peerless beauties, a mean miserable idiot. I whispered Herbert. I know that lady, said Herbert across the table, when the toast had been honoured. Do you? said Drummle. And so do I, I added, with a scarlet face. Do you? said Drummle. Oh, Lord! This was the only retort except glass or crockery that the heavy creature was capable of making, but, I became as highly incensed by it as if it had been barbed with wit and I immediately rose in my place and said that I could not but regard it as being like the Honourable Finch's impudence to come down to that grove we always talked about coming down to that grove, as a neat parliamentary turn of expression down to that grove, proposing a lady of whom he knew nothing. Mr. Drumle upon this, starting up, 
demanded what I meant by that? Whereupon, I made him the extreme reply that I believed he knew where I was to be found. Whether it was possible in a Christian country to get on without blood, after this, was a question on which the finches were divided. The debate upon it grew so lively, indeed, that at least six more honorable members told six more, during the discussion, that they believed they knew where they were to be found. However, it was decided at last, the grove being a court of honor, that if Mr. Drummle would bring never so slight a certificate from the lady, importing that he had the honor of her acquaintance, Mr. Pip must express his regret, as a gentleman in a finch, for having been betrayed into a warmth which. Next Charles Dickens' Elec Book Classics Great Expectations Great Expectations I tell this lightly, but it was no light thing to me. For, I cannot adequately express what pain it gave me to think that Estella should show any favor to a contemptible, clumsy, sulky booby, so very far below the average. To the present moment, I believe it to have been referable to some pure fire of generosity and disinterestedness in my love for her that I could not endure the thought of her stooping to that hound. No doubt I should have been miserable whomsoever she had favored, but a worthier object would have caused me a different kind and degree of distress. It was easy for me to find out, and I did soon find out, that Drummle had begun to follow her closely, and that she allowed him to do it. A little while, and he was always in pursuit of her, and he and I crossed one another every day. He held on, in a dull persistent way, and Estella held him on, now with encouragement, now with discouragement, now almost flattering him, now openly despising him, now knowing him very well, now scarcely remembering who he was. The spider, as Mr. Jaggers had called him, was used to lying in Charles Dickens' Elec Book Classics Great Expectations Great Expectations at a certain assembly ball at Richmond, there used to be assembly balls at most places then, where Estella had outshone all other beauties, this blundering drum was so hung about her, and with so much toleration on her part, that I resolved to speak to her concerning him. I took the next opportunity, which was when she was waiting for MRS. Brandley to take her home, and was sitting apart among some flowers, ready to go. I was with her, for I almost always accompanied them to and from such places. Are you tired, Estella? Rather, Pip. You should be. Say rather, I should not be, for I have my letter to Satis House to write, before I go to sleep. Recounting tonight's triumph. Said I. Surely a very poor one, Estella. What do you mean? I didn't know there had been any. Estella, said I, do look at that fellow in the corner yonder, who is looking over here at us. Why should I look at him? Returned Estella, with her eyes on me instead. What is there in that fellow in the corner yonder to use your words that I need look at? Indeed. That is the very question I want to ask you, said I. Charles Dickens' Elec Book Classics Great Expectations Great Expectations Moths, and all sorts of ugly creatures, replied Estella, with a glance towards him, hover about a lighted candle. Can the candle help it? No, I returned, but cannot the Estella help it? Well, said she, laughing, after a moment, perhaps. Yes. Anything you like. But, Estella, do hear me speak. It makes me wretched that you should encourage a man so generally despised as Drummle. You know he is despised. Well. Said she. You know he is as ungainly within, as without. A deficient, ill-tempered, lowering, stupid fellow. Well said she. You know he has nothing to recommend him but money, and a ridiculous roll of addle-headed predecessors, now, don't you? Well, said she again, and each time she said it, she opened her lovely eyes the wider. 
To overcome the difficulty of getting past that monosyllable, I took it from her, and said, repeating it with emphasis, Well. Then, that is why it makes me wretched. Now, if I could have believed that she favored Drummle with any idea of making me me wretched, I should have been in better heart about it, but in that habitual way of hers, she put me so entirely out of the question, that I could believe nothing of the kind. Pip, said Estella, casting her glance over the room, don't be foolish about its effect on you. It may have its effect on others, and may be meant to have. It's not worth discussing. Charles Dickens' Elec Book Classics Great Expectations Great Expectations I Can Bear It, said Estella. Oh! Don't be so proud, Estella, and so inflexible. Calls me proud and inflexible in this breath, said Estella, opening her hands. And in his last breath reproached me for stooping to a bore. There is no doubt you do, said I, something hurriedly, for I have seen you give him looks and smiles this very night, such as you never give to me. Do you want me then, said Estella? turning suddenly with a fixed and serious, if not angry, look, to deceive and entrap you. Do you deceive and entrap him, Estella? Yes, and many others all of them but you. Here is MRS. Brandley. I'll say no more. And now that I have given the one chapter to the theme that so filled my heart, and so often made it ache and ache again, I pass on, unhindered to the event that had impended over me longer yet, the event that had begun to be prepared for, before I knew that the world held Estella, and in the days when her baby intelligence was receiving its first distortions from Miss Havisham's wasting hands. In the Eastern story, the heavy slab that was to fall on the bed of state in the flush of conquest was slowly wrought out of the quarry, the tunnel for the rope to hold it in its place was slowly carried through the leagues of rock the slab was slowly raised and fitted in the roof, the rope was rove to it and slowly taken through Charles Dickens' Elec Book Classics Great Expectations Great Expectations Charles Dickens' Elec Book Classics Great Expectations Great Expectations was three and twenty years of age. Not another word had I heard to enlighten me on the subject of my expectations, and my twenty-third birthday was a week gone. We had left Barnard's in more than a year and lived in the temple. Our chambers were in Garden Court, down by the river. Mr. Pocket and I had for some time parted company as to our original relations, though we continued on the best terms. Notwithstanding my inability to settle to anything which I hope arose out of the restless and incomplete tenure on which I held my means I had a taste for reading, and read regularly so many hours a day. That matter of Herbert's was still progressing, and everything with me was as I have brought it down to the close of the last preceding chapter. Business had taken Herbert on a journey to Marseilles. I was alone, and had a dull sense of being alone. Dispirited and anxious, long hoping that tomorrow or next week would clear my way, and long disappointed, I sadly missed the cheerful face and ready response of my friend. It was wretched weather. Stormy and wet, stormy and wet, and mud, 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 deep in all the streets. Day after day, a vast heavy veil had been driving over London from the east, and it drove still, as if in the east there were an eternity of cloud and wind. So furious had been the gusts, that high buildings in town had had the lead stripped off their roofs, and in the country, trees had been torn up, and sails of windmills carried away and gloomy accounts had come in from the coast of shipwreck and death. Violent blasts of rain had accompanied these rages of wind, and the day just Charles Dickens' Elec Book Classics Great Expectations Great Expectations alterations have been made in that part of the temple since that time, and it has not now so lonely a character as it had then, nor is it so exposed to the river. We lived at the top of the last house, and the wind rushing up the river shook the house that night, like discharges of cannon, or breakings of a sea. When the rain came with it and dashed against the windows, I thought, 
raising my eyes to them as they rocked, that I might have fancied myself in a storm-beaten lighthouse. Occasionally, the smoke came rolling down the chimney as though it could not bear to go out into such a night, and when I set the doors open and looked down the staircase, the staircase lamps were blown out, and when I shaded my face with my hands and looked through the black windows, opening them ever so little, was out of the question in the teeth of such wind and rain, I saw that the lamps in the court were blown out, and that the lamps on the bridges and the shore were shuddering, and that the coal fires in barges on the river were being carried away before the wind like red-hot splashes in the rain. I read with my watch upon the table, purposing to close my book at eleven o'clock. As I shut it, St. Paul's, and all the many church clocks in the city some leading, some accompanying, some following struck that hour. The sound was curiously flawed by the wind, and I was listening, and thinking how the wind assailed and tore it, when I heard a footstep on the stair. What nervous folly made me start, and awfully connect it with the footstep of my dead sister, matters not. It was passed in a moment, and I listened again, and heard the footstep stumble in coming on. Remembering then, that the staircase lights were Charles Dickens' Elec book classics Great Expectations Great Expectations Head. Whoever was below had stopped on seeing my lamp, for all was quiet. There is someone down there, is there not? I called out, looking down. Yes, said a voice from the darkness beneath. What floor do you want? The top. M.R. Pib. That is my name there is nothing the matter. Nothing the matter, returned the voice. And the man came on. I stood with my lamp held out over the stair rail, and he came slowly within its light. It was a shaded lamp, to shine upon a book, and its circle of light was very contracted, so that he was in it for a mere instant, and then out of it. In the instant, I had seen a face that was strange to me looking up with an incomprehensible air of being touched and pleased by the sight of me. Moving the lamp as the man moved, I made out that he was substantially dressed, but roughly, like a voyager by sea. That he had long iron-gray hair. That his age was about sixty. That he was a muscular man, strong on his legs, and that he was browned and hardened by exposure to weather. As he ascended the last stair or two, and the light of my lamp included us both, I saw, with a stupid kind of amazement, that he was holding out both his hands to me. Pray what is your business? I asked him. My business? He repeated, pausing. Ah. Yes. I will explain my business, by your leave. Do you wish to come in? Charles Dickens' Elec Book Classics Great Expectations Great Expectations I had asked him the question inhospitably enough, for I resented the sort of bright and gratified recognition that still shone in his face. I resented it, because it seemed to imply that he expected me to respond to it. But, I took him into the room I had just left, and, having set the lamp on the table, asked him as civilly as I could, to explain himself. He looked about him with the strangest air and air of wondering pleasure, as if he had some part in the things he admired and he pulled off a rough outer coat, and his hat. Then, I saw that his head was furrowed and bald, and that the long iron-gray hair grew only on its sides. But, I saw nothing that in the least explained him. On the contrary, I saw him next moment, once more holding out both his hands to me. What do you mean? said I, half suspecting him to be mad. He stopped in his looking at me, and slowly rubbed his right hand over his head. It's disappointing to a man, he said, in a coarse broken voice, Arter having looked for art so distant, and come so fur, but you're not to blame for that neither on us is to blame for that. I'll speak in half a minute. Give me half a minute, please. He sat down on a chair that stood before the fire, and covered his forehead with his large brown venous hands. I looked at him attentively then, 
and recoiled a little from him, but I did not know him. There's no one nigh, said he, looking over his shoulder, is there? Why do you, a stranger coming into my rooms at this time of the night, ask that question? Said I. You're a game one, he returned, shaking his head at me with Charles Dickens' Alec book classics Great Expectations Great Expectations I relinquished the intention he had detected, for I knew him. Even yet, I could not recall a single feature, but I knew him. If the wind and the rain had driven away the intervening years, had scattered all the intervening objects, had swept us to the churchyard where we first stood face to face on such different levels, I could not have known my convict more distinctly than I knew him now as he sat in the chair before the fire. No need to take a file from his pocket and show it to me, no need to take the handkerchief from his neck and twist it round his head, no need to hug himself with both his arms, and take a shivering turn across the room, looking back at me for recognition. I knew him before he gave me one of those aids, though, a moment before, I had not been conscious of remotely suspecting his identity. He came back to where I stood, and again held out both his hands. Not knowing what to do for, in my astonishment I had lost my self-possession I reluctantly gave him my hands. He grasped them heartily, raised them to his lips, kissed them, and still held them. You acted noble, my boy, said he. Noble, Pip. And I have never forgot it. At a change in his manner as if he were even going to embrace me, I laid a hand upon his breast and put him away. Stay. Said I. Keep off. If you are grateful to me for what I did when I was a little child, I hope you have shown your gratitude by mending your way of life. If you have come here to thank me, it was not necessary. Still, however you have found me out, there Charles Dickens' Alec book classics Great Expectations Great Expectations My attention was so attracted by the singularity of his fixed look at me, that the words died away on my tongue. You was a saying, he observed, when we had confronted one another in silence, that surely I must understand. What? Surely must I understand. That I cannot wish to renew that chance intercourse with you of long ago, under these different circumstances. I am glad to believe you have repented and recovered yourself. I am glad to tell you so. I am glad that, thinking I deserve to be thanked, you have come to thank me. But our ways are different ways, nonetheless. You are wet, and you look weary. Will you drink something before you go? He had replaced his neckerchief loosely, and had stood, keenly observant of me, biting a long end of it. I think, he answered, still with the end at his mouth and still observant of me, that I will drink, I thank you, afore I go. There was a tray ready on a side table. I brought it to the table near the fire, and asked him what he would have. He touched one of the bottles without looking at it or speaking, and I made him some hot rum and water. I tried to keep my hand steady while I did so, but his look at me as he leaned back in his chair with the long draggled end of his neckerchief between his teeth evidently forgotten made my hand very difficult to master. When at last I put the glass to him, I saw with amazement that his eyes were full of tears. Up to this time I had remained standing not to disguise that I Charles Dickens' Alec book classics Great Expectations Great Expectations as I put my glass to my lips, he glanced with surprise at the end of his neckerchief, dropping from his mouth when he opened it, and stretched out his hand. I gave him mine, and then he drank, and drew his sleeve across his eyes and forehead. How are you living? I asked him. I've been a sheep farmer, stock breeder, other trades besides, away in the new world, said he. Many a thousand mile of stormy water off from this. I hope you have done well. I've done wonderfully well. There's others went out a longer me as has done well too, but no man has done nigh as well as me. I'm famous for it. 
I am glad to hear it. I hope to hear you say so, my dear boy. Without stopping to try to understand those words or the tone in which they were spoken, I turned off to a point that had just come into my mind. Have you ever seen a messenger you once sent to me, I inquired, since he undertook that trust? Never set eyes upon him. I warned he likely to it. He came faithfully, and he brought me the two one-pound notes. I was a poor boy then, as you know, and to a poor boy they were a little fortune. But, like you, I have done well since, and you Charles Dickens' Alec Book Classics Great Expectations Great Expectations He watched me as I laid my purse upon the table and opened it, and he watched me as I separated two one-pound notes from its contents. They were clean and new, and I spread them out and handed them over to him. Still watching me, he laid them one upon the other, folded them longwise, gave them a twist, set fire to them at the lamp, and dropped the ashes into the tray. May I make so bold, he said then, with a smile that was like a frown, and with a frown that was like a smile, as ask you how you have done well since you and me was out on them lone shivering marshes. How? Ah! He emptied his glass, got up, and stood at the side of the fire, with his heavy brown hand on the mantel shelf. He put a foot up to the bars, to dry and warm it, and the wet boot began to steam, but, he neither looked at it, nor at the fire, but steadily looked at me. It was only now that I began to tremble. When my lips had parted, and had shaped some words that were without sound, I forced myself to tell him, though I could not do it distinctly, that I had been chosen to succeed to some property. Might a mere warmint ask what property? said he. I faltered, I don't know. Might a mere warmint ask whose property? said he. I faltered again, I don't know. Could I make a guess? I wonder, said the convict, at your income since you come of age. As to the first figure now. 5. Charles Dickens' Alec Book Classics Great Expectations Great Expectations Concerning a Guardian, he went on. There ought to have been some guardian, or such like, whiles you was a minor. Some lawyer, maybe. As to the first letter of that lawyer's name now. Would it be J? All the truth of my position came flashing on me, and its disappointments, dangers, disgraces, consequences of all kinds, rushed in in such a multitude that I was borne down by them and had to struggle for every breath I drew. Put it, he resumed, as the employer of that lawyer whose name begun with AJ, and might be Jaggers put it as he had come over sea to Portsmouth, and had landed there and had wanted to come on to you. However, you have found me out, you says just now. Well. However, did I find you out? Why, I wrote from Portsmouth to a person in London, for particulars of your address. That person's name? Why, Wemmick. I could not have spoken one word, though it had been to save my life. I stood with a hand on the chair back and a hand on my breast, where I seemed to be suffocating I stood so, looking wildly at him, until I grasped at the chair, when the room began to surge and turn. He caught me, drew me to the sofa, put me up against the cushions, and bent on one knee before me. Bringing the face that I now well remembered, and that I shuddered at, very near to mine. Yes, Pip, dear boy. I've made a gentleman on you. It's me what has done it. I swore that time, sure as ever I earned a guinea, that guinea should go to you. I swore Arter Wards, sure as ever I Charles Dickens' Alec Book Classics Great Expectations Great Expectations The abhorrence in which I held the man, the dread I had of him, the repugnance with which I shrank from him, could not have been exceeded if he had been some terrible beast. Look ye here, Pip. I'm your second father. You're my son more to me nor any son. I've put away money, 
only for you to spend. When I was a hired out shepherd in a solitary hut, not seeing no faces but faces of sheep till I half forgot what men's and women's faces was like, I see yourn. I drops my knife many a time in that hut when I was a eating my dinner or my supper, and I says, here's the boy again, a looking at me whiles I eats and drinks. I see you there a many times, as plain as ever I see you on them misty marshes. Lord strike me dead. I says each time and I goes out in the air to say it under the open heavens but what, if I gets liberty and money, I'll make that boy a gentleman. And I done it. Why, look at you, dear boy. Look at these here lodgings o' oh yourn, fit for a lord. A lord? Ah. You shall show money with lords for wagers, and beat em. In his heat and triumph, and in his knowledge that I had been nearly fainting, he did not remark on my reception of all this. It was the one grain of relief I had. Look ye here. He went on taking my watch out of my pocket, and turning towards him a ring on my finger, while I recoiled from his touch as if he had been a snake, a gold un and a beauty. That's Charles Dickens' Elec book classics Great Expectations Great Expectations Again he took both my hands and put them to his lips, while my blood ran cold within me. Don't you mind talking, Pip, said he, after again drawing his sleeve over his eyes and forehead as the click came in his throat which I well remembered and he was all the more horrible to me that he was so much in earnest, you can't do better nor keep quiet, dear boy. You ain't looked slowly forward to this as I have, you wasn't he prepared for this, as I was. But didn't you never think it might be me? Oh no, 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 I returned, never, never. Well, you see it was me and single-handed. Never a soul in it but my own self and M.R. Jaggers. Was there no one else? I asked. No, said he, with a glance of surprise. Who else should there be? And, dear boy, how good-looking you have growed. There's bright eyes somewheres at. Isn't there bright eyes somewheres, what you love the thoughts on? Oh Estella, Estella. They shall be yourn, dear boy, if money can buy em. Not that a gentleman like you, so well set up as you, can't win em off of his own game, but money shall back you. Let me finish what I was at Charles Dickens' Elec book classics Great Expectations Great Expectations out, I got money left me by my master, which died, and had been the same as me and got my liberty and went for myself. In every single thing I went for, I went for you. Lord strike a blight upon it, I says, whatever it was I went for, if it ain't for him. It all prospered wonderful. As I give you to understand just now, I'm famous for it. It was the money left me, and the gains of the first few year what I sent home to M.R. Jagger's all for you when he first come arter you, agreeable to my letter. Oh, that he had never come. That he had left me at the forge far from contented, yet, by comparison happy. And then, dear boy, it was a recompense to me, look ye here, to know in secret that I was making a gentleman. The blood horses of them colonists might fling up the dust over me as I was walking, what do I say? I says to myself, I'm making a better gentleman nor ever you'll be. When one of em says to another, he was a convict, a few year ago, and is a ignorant common fellow now, for all he's lucky, what do I say? I says to myself, if I ain't a gentleman, nor yet ain't got no learning, I'm the owner of such. All on you owns stock and land, which on you owns a brought up London gentleman. This way I kept myself a-going. And this way I held steady afore my mind that I would for certain come one day and see my boy, and make myself known to him, on his own ground. He laid his hand on my shoulder. I shuddered at the thought that for anything I knew, his hand might be stained with blood. It warn't easy, 
hip, for me to leave them parts, nor yet it worn tea safe. But I held to it, and the harder it was, the stronger I held, for I was determined, and my mind firm made up. At last I done it. Charles Dickens Elec Book Classics Great Expectations Great Expectations I tried to collect my thoughts, but I was stunned. Throughout, I had seemed to myself to attend more to the wind and the rain than to him, even now, I could not separate his voice from those voices, though those were loud and his was silent. Where will you put me? He asked, presently. I must be put somewheres, dear boy. To sleep. Said I. Yes. And to sleep long and sound, he answered, for I've been sea-tossed and sea-washed, months and months. My friend and companion, said I, rising from the sofa, is absent, you must have his room. He won't come back tomorrow, will he? No, said I, answering almost mechanically, in spite of my utmost efforts, not tomorrow. Because, look ee -e here, dear boy, he said, dropping his voice, and laying a long finger on my breast in an impressive manner, caution is necessary. How do you mean? Caution. By gee, it's death. What's death? I was sent for life. It's death to come back. There's been overmuch coming back of late years, and I should of a certainty be hanged if took. Nothing was needed but this, the wretched man, after loading wretched me with his gold and silver chains for years, had risked his life to come to me, and I held it there in my keeping. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.